All right, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome. We have attendees joining our webinar this afternoon. This is the introduction to wildlife tracking training with Kelly Bailey um, here with the Community Nature Connection Training Institute. Welcome, welcome. I'll allow a minute or so for folks to join us before we jump into things. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, as we allow for folks to join, I'd love to invite everybody to introduce themselves. Thank you, Sylvia, um, for starting that off. If you'd like to introduce yourself, tell us your name, um, where you're joining from, what organization you're representing, if any. And we're excited to have everybody here today. So once again, welcome. Um, my name is Celeste Gasparic. I'm the Training Institute Manager with Community Nature Connection. And I'm joining you all today from my home in Northeast LA, the ancestral lands of the Tongva and Quiche peoples. Um, for those of you just joining, we uh, are wel welcoming you and would like to invite you to introduce yourself uh, using the chat. You can type your name, uh, where you're joining from, and then uh, if you're representing an organization, you can let us know what that is. So before we get started with the wildlife tracking training, um, a little bit about Community Nature Connection. We are a nonprofit community-based organization serving the Los Angeles area. Our mission is to increase access to the outdoors for communities impacted by racial, socioeconomic, and disability injustices. We do this by eliminating existing barriers through advocacy, community-centered programming, and workforce development. So today you're here in the wildlife tracking training um, and this is brought to you as part of our training institute. The Community Nature Connections Training Institute provides training and workforce development opportunities that aim to increase participant knowledge and skills in the naturalist, interpretive, and outdoor recreation fields. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're using a Zoom webinar format today and Kelly, our trainer, is going to be welcoming your questions, um, and sh she'll be answering those throughout her training and throughout her presentation. So go ahead, if questions arise throughout the training, um, enter them into the Q&A box, and you should see that there's a little bar at the bottom of your screen, and you should see um, Q&A, and you can open that and type in any questions that may come up during the training um, and Kelly will field those as they come in. Um, so at this point, I am very excited to hand it over to Kelly Bailey. Kelly is a certified wildlife tracker and a program manager here at Community Nature Connection. So thank you so much, Kelly, for being here and take it away. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, some of my background is in wildlife trekking, wildlife signs, and wildlife scouting. That started while I was in college and grad school. I minored in wildlife biology, and I became really interested in the urban foxes that were in the area that my school was in. And I became obsessed with trying to recognize where the foxes had been, how I could tell they'd been there. And I added that wildlife biology credit to my minor as soon as I became obsessed. Uh, when I moved back to the States and to California, I continued that as part of the citizen science program with the National Park Service. And part of my focus was tracking large mammals through the Santa Monica Mountains. And we'll go into why we do that. Uh, coming from San Fernando Valley, and I want to provide a land acknowledgement. Today, we acknowledge this land, the ancestral home of the Tongva people, the original stewards and custodians of this territory. And we recognize their continued connection to the land 
waters, and culture, and we pay our respects to the elders past, present, and future. As Sala said, my name is Kelly Bailey. I'm a program manager with Community Nature Connection. My pronouns are she, her, and my background we just went over, but it also includes work within my role with Community Nature Connection, working with youth. And when you've got a lot of kids out in the field on trails, it's very unlikely to see a live animal but it's a great opportunity to show them that an animal was recently there. I'm gonna start by saying, what is a track? So track is any type of impression that's left preferably in soft ground. That could be sand, mud, snow, uh, soil even, if impression that's left in that surface. And it could be a full impression, it could be a partial impression, it could be a half of an impression. And through tracking and experience in tracking, that's something trackers begin to recognize. With a complete track, experienced trackers will tell you which foot of the animal left it, if it was the left or right foot, what was the sex of the animal, how old the animal is, and how fast they were traveling. There's a lot you can learn in tracking, but we're just introducing principles today. So what is a sign? And you'll hear people talking about tracking or reading signs. Signs could be anything from some fur left by a deer to flattened grass that shows coyotes were napping there to broken twigs to show a predator chased prey. And it could even be my one of my favorite things, scat. And scat will tell you the entire food chain that happened right there at that moment. A sign, we should use those as a clue to a track. You may not see a track in this fresh grass, but you know that an animal traveled there because of the sign they left behind. Oh, oh. Why do we track wildlife? Uh, I track wildlife as part of my research, but hunters track wildlife to have a better understanding of the, the uh, items they can hunt in their area. Biologists like my friend Jeff here, track wildlife to understand what animals are in a region, how they're doing health-wise, and what we can do to help protect them if needed. This coyote is wearing a GPS collar, and that's the final step in the tracking stage. So you start by finding a coyote track. Maybe you have found a collection of coyote tracks. Their scat maybe looks healthy or doesn't look healthy, and you're curious how active they are in that area. You set up a wildlife camera. You find out what their patterns are by watching the camera. Then you tranquilize this beautiful coyote, you fit him with a GPS collar, and this collar will go off intermittently as it travels, and you'll get to know its full territory by it wearing this collar. What conditions are best for tracking? I like to talk about Southern California, we don't get a lot of rain, there's not a lot of mud around, we don't get any snow. But what I do like that we get is dew. And if you're an early riser like I am, if you go out about 5 a.m., 6 a.m., you might see dew on the grass. That's a great time to go out and track. Places like Runyon Canyon, Franklin Canyon, these fire roads are full of sand. Those are great places to go track. You want to avoid popular trails just like wildlife does. You don't want to go out and look for a bobcat in the middle of Runyon Canyon at noon on a Saturday. You want to go out in an early morning before the rest of the humans have decided to go out. Some of the types of tracks we're going to offer identification of today are the common tracks of some mammals. We're going to cover some hooved animals. 
we're going to cover a couple of reptiles and we're going to talk about some deer and another type of track just what we talked about this image here is about the bobcats in the santa monica mountains that are wearing gps collars so they went through the process and all these little dots are bobcat at a particular moment traveling around the mountains. The different colors distinguish sex and the region they're in. Who's ready to talk about snakes? So snakes, you have to picture, you know, they're the danger noodle. We all call them, well, some of us call them that. Their body allows them to move based on the environment they find them in. And there's basically four movements all snake use, and that means there's four types of tracks you might find if you're out on the trail looking for snake tracks. There'll be a drawing of the type of movement the snake is using and then what their track may look like. This reticular locomotion is the type of movement that's done by a large, heavy-bodied snake. This could be a snake that just ate and is digesting. It could be one of the larger gopher snakes, something like that. They're going to leave a kind of, oh, I'm sluggish. I just ate a big meal. I don't really want to move kind of track. Lateral undulations, which is what we all think of when we think of the way a snake moves, is this kind of get up and go, uh, it makes it so the snake can actually actively move and there's no obstacles in its way. They may go around a rock or a stick at this way, but they're not going to use this if they're full. They're going to use this when they're full of energy. The size of the snake will dictate, obviously, the size of the curves and the size of the trail, meaning the shallowness of the trail. Concertina locomotion leaves a different set of tracks. And this is more of a, say it's a hot day and the snake doesn't want to put all of its weight down on the hot ground. It's only gonna use the amount of motion it takes to move forward, oops, sorry, but not put all its weight down. I find a lot of rattlesnake tracks use this motion, especially if I go into Joshua Tree in Death Valley. And then the sidewinder is the snake that leaves a track that looks like a drawing of a snake. So I'm gonna play a little video for you. And what? that snake is doing is it's saying, I don't want to touch any of the sand. This is boiling hot sand. So I'm going to touch it with my tail and with my head, and I'm going to drag my body across the sand. You'll see some snakes, if you go to maybe the sand dunes that are near, uh, oh my goodness, the sand dunes that are not quite to Joshua Tree, you'll see some snakes that are not sidewinders use a similar type of track because of the, the type of sand that's there. It's really slippery. It's hard for them to use their muscles to catch on to. So you see where he's putting all his weight and then he's dragging. They're pretty great snakes. All right, next reptile is the lizard. And if you saw this track in the field, you may think, oh, that's a lizard. Or you might think, oh, it's a turtle. Oh, it's a bird. And the difference in lizard tracks and any of those other things that have a tail that drag behind them is the track of the foot. Some people say it looks like a hand. You'll get those hands but you also get a tail 
that has broken pieces around it. And that's, we've all seen Western fence lizards. That's because they move like this and then they freeze and then they move like that and then they freeze. And that's what the tail is showing you. The lizard went like this. What's going on over here? What's going on over here? What's going on over here? And so on. The lizard tracks, if you're able to see, move in real close to your screen, they all have nails that stick out that you can see here. There'll be nails there, there's nails here. And nails and not nails are a big part of tracking. We'll talk about that. Birds who are descended from dinosaurs, not lizards, uh, have four types of tracks that they leave. But the perching bird track, if you are out in Los Angeles tracking in a nature area, is the one you will most likely see if you are looking for birds. And what makes their track and foot distinctive is that they have three toes in the front with nails and a toe in the back with nails. And that's so that they can sit and hold on to a branch, a twig, something like that. But these nails are not retractable, so they always leave a little dot. And their feet are very easy to find as they leave a track because these birds generally hop. So you'll see a set of tracks, and then you'll look up and you'll see a set of tracks, and you'll see a set of tracks. So it's not three birds, but one bird hopping. Swimming birds, everybody's favorite. Uh, swimming birds have a lot of people call them webbed toes. They have skin attached via the nails. All webbed birds' feet look like this. The difference would be some swimming birds, like the cormorant, instead of having four toes, they have five toes. But same basic track. If you want to go out and look for easy tracks around uh, where's a good place? Echo Park's a good place to look for these guys. Franklin Canyon is sometimes a good place to look for these guys. It's a good beginner track to e easily recognize. Game birds like uh, turkeys or pheasants are called walking birds. These guys also have one, two, three, four toes, but that fourth toe shows up like this. Instead of looking like a long finger, it has a dot and the bird uses that to run when it's, think of it as when it's being hunted. If you've ever seen a turkey in the wild, they are active and fast moving creatures. And that's how they get around with these feet. Um, in Los Padres National Forest, which is pretty close to here, Ventura County, there are wild turkeys. And that's where this picture was taken. You can see them running around and you can see great tracks down by the stream bed. Amphibian tracks look like this. So uh, what makes looking for frogs and bullfrog, this is a bullfrog track, tracks challenging is that they generally don't leave a track unless they were sitting in water the water evaporated or the tides moved, they will land on the mud, they will sit there, and then they'll jump out of it to rejoin the water. So finding the tracks, very unusual, but what you can tell from this track are all the points that it put pressure. This is the body, this is the front legs, and this is the back legs. All those points were pressure points. Now to everybody's favorite. I'm going to start with felines and then go into canines and then do some sort of popular uh, animals in the Santa Monica Mountains. Feline tracks all generally look similar. And the way you tell them apart is by size and location. Domestic cats leave a very similar track to a bobcat because they're similar size, but a mountain lion track is much larger than a bobcat or a domestic cat's track. 
We're going to get a close up soon. But I want you to take a look at the four toes, the pad, and then on the back of the pad are these three lobes. And those lobes are a big indicator of a feline track. Another trick people use is they say if you visually draw a line here and here and here and here, it kind of looks like a star or like a U-shaped star. You can't make that shape with canine tracks. So felines, there's a huge heel pad. There's the lobes, three lobes, and there's four toes. Also, no nails. Anybody who has a pet cat will, can attest that you don't hear cats as they walk in the kitchen, sneaking up on you for treats. Here are some toe beans of a domestic cat. Exactly the same, the four toe pads, the, the heel pad, and the three lobes. This is the oldest recorded track of a domestic cat, and it was found in the ruins of a Roman village. And apparently some craftsmen, as all cat owners have done, is trying to do some work, and a cat decided to be right in the middle of it and walked across it. <laughs> Here's our mountain lion, very similar to the domestic cat, four toes, heel pad, and the three lobes, but much larger. See the difference between this and the human hand and the other one, I can't go backwards. The track, again, if you wanna think about that star formation coming down, you can count the toes or you can look for the three lobes on the back. No nail prints. You will sometimes find feline tracks with nails if it's a severely muddy area or if it's a large incline. Just like a domestic cat, they'll use those nails to climb or to get their footing. Canine tracks, on the other hand, typically always show nails. If you are a dog owner, you've heard dogs walk through the kitchen. You know exactly where a dog is walking when it's in your house. The size of canine tracks, the largest one is the wolf. The smallest one is the coyote, but you'll see they all have the same basic shape. Just like the star, we have a trick for canine tracks and that's if X marks the spot. If you can draw an X shape, without hitting the heel pad, then you're looking at a canine track. Does everybody get that? A, another distinct difference, a lot of people when they're starting out will ID a domestic dog track as a coyote. Or if they're in wolf country, they'll ID it as a wolf. The main difference is if you look at a coyote track, it's tight and it's oval shaped. Domestic dogs are round. They don't have to hunt for food is the way I think about it. They don't have to chase things. So their foot is a little more relaxed when it leaves a track as opposed to a hunter who chases its food down. Here's a, another image of a domestic dog. Got the toes. This is what their heel pad looks like with the swoop. And I can make an X right through there without hitting the pad. Again, they're going to leave toe marks. Here's the X pattern. And here's the swooped lobe. This one looks like it's got the three points, but it doesn't. Because why? Because we can make the X formation through it. The gray wolf, I included it because we have a few gray wolves in California and one that's close to the central coast. So hopefully we get gray wolves in Southern California, but same exact design, just much larger. So where a coyote track would be about two inches, the gray wolf is almost five inches. But again, you can make the X formation 
These are little nail points and the lobe does a little swoop. Here's the coyote up close with a penny for reference. We can make the X. We see the toe, the uh, nails here. And we see the little swoop. Gray fox, they are very mysterious and I haven't seen one up close yet, but we do have them. Exact same thing. All canines have that X marks the spot and they'll always leave nail prints. So these guys, it's a little harder to see, but there's a little nail right there and right there. Any questions before I go forward? Great. So I've included a couple of hooved animals because they are local. Our mule deer, some people say the feet are like hearts, but most hooved animals will leave the same type track and the same type scat if they're healthy. You'll see these two points come together and their scat will be pellets. So this is the bighorn sheep, another heart formation. This is what it looks like. The only way you would really know that as the difference would be the length and where you found it. Bighorn sheep are only in certain parts of Los Angeles, while mule deer are everywhere in Los Angeles. The feet are a little tighter, closer together, and they're not as long. The Virginia opossum, people say it, the track is like a little hand reaching out. That gives you a reference here. Think of the thumb is always flat out when it's walking. So that will give you this hind leg and the front is always reaching. You will see nails in the tracks. This pad usually doesn't show this distinction in shape. They're nocturnal. So you'll find them in the early morning hours before other people step on them. My favorite buddy, waving hello. This is the raccoon, another nocturnal animal. Another guy who has great hands you see here. And this is his back foot. A little bit longer because they jump and climb through trees. The wood rat, I included him because he's in Topanga Canyon, Franklin Canyon, Malibu Creek. So they're around, but you don't often see them. But you'll see their tracks that they left behind. Most small rodents, uh, black rats, field mice, wood rats are all going to have the same similar track. If you want to look for these guys, you look for them near their nests, usually found on hillsides or leaning against trees. Little Tidbit here, uh, in very, very hot areas that tend to flood, wood rats and rattlesnakes will share a nest as a copacetic relationship. The wood rat builds the nest, the rattlesnake agrees not to eat the wood rat to get to live in the nest. Here's our California ground squirrel. Sort of an angled track that it leaves. You'll see the nails here. and you find them in the woodland areas of California. If you were to compare this to a tree squirrel, it would be very similar. The difference would be the location you find it and that little curve whoosh that it gives when it's running from predators. Here's our California black bear. These guys have two tracks to look out for. They are more prevalent north of the 101, but we tracked one in Topanga Canyon a couple of years ago. The front paw has a rounded pad with toes. The back paw has an elongated oval pad with toes. These guys climb trees. They live in dens. 
So you can find them anywhere that there is uh, berries, plenty of water. Um, don't be surprised if you're out at some park and then you come across a black bear track. Our striped skunk has a similar foot to the black bear. The back of it is this elongated pad with toes and the nails showing. It looks like this, elongated with the toes. The nails are the important thing. Because then we get to our brush rabbits. And this is a photo in snow. I did not take this photo, but it shows the movement of the brush rabbit. The brush rabbit will start off on its hind feet. It will jump in the air and then it will land with its back feet in front of its hind feet. The back feet are all the power in the jump and the front feet kind of do the steering. So if you see a combination like this, most likely in a brush area, not a wooded area, you'd have an idea of who's there. Most rabbits have the exact same size of foot. The jackrabbit cottontail has a longer hind foot because of sand, just like the sidewinder. So a uh, tracking that a lot of people don't pursue is insect tracking. And just like we said at the beginning, anything that can leave a footprint can leave a track. So I've included two tracks here. On the right is a ladybug track. And ladybugs are beetles, so six legs walking in formation, trying to decide where they want to go, dragging the shell. And the one on the left are ant tracks, and they were leading up to a water source. So how do we know they're ants? Because we saw the ants. But there are people who specifically specialize in just insect tracking and checking the population of insects. So I included these because I wanted to share that anything could be tracked if you're willing to, I guess, look close enough. So I'm gonna remind everybody the difference. How do you tell the difference in a canine and a feline track? We have the claw marks. We have X marks the spot. We have the front of the heel pad goes in a swoop, it's the swoop. And for the feline track, we have the four toes spread out. The real, the rear, excuse me, has the three lobes, two lobes, and there are no nails. The, uh, most people want to find a mountain lion track. Most people confuse a mountain lion track for a pet dog track or a coyote. The best habits when photographing tracks, I've kind of said this through, sorry, is uh, best time of your day is early morning or right at sunset when there are not a lot of people around, when there's not a lot of traffic. Most animals will use the trails that humans use. They'll just wait until they're not being used. Um, if there's a storm, trackers get really excited because they'll go out the next morning after rain to look for those mud impressions. But most animals will not be out during a storm or severe weather. If you get caught out and it's sprinkling and everything's disappeared, that's a great time to look for snake tracks because snakes are always looking for fresh water to drink. But generally, if it rains all day on a Wednesday, Thursday morning, I'm going to be out on the trail at 6 a.m. looking for tracks before the early morning joggers and walkers get out there. A uh, collected where to look for what type of animal in Los Angeles for you. Let me just find my notes. Franklin Canyon, which is my uh, where my office normally is. It's a great place to look for the tracks of the ducks, aquatic animals around our pond and around our lake. I have found bullfrog tracks there 
I have found coyote tracks there, gray fox, mule deer, mountain lion, bobcat, squirrel. Um, there's lots of tracks there. It's a little forest area if you've been there before, but it's very, very popular. I've also included Malibu Creek State Park. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's in the western part of the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, there we've seen mountain lion, bobcat, coyote, badger, snakes, lizards, turtles, owls, crows and ravens and sparrows. And I'll send this list with the information with the PowerPoint maybe. Topanga State Park uh, is where we tracked the black bear track that we didn't expect to see there. Turkey vultures, tarantulas, opossums, raccoons. The Angeles National Forest is great for the bighorn sheep. There is a thriving population of black bears there. There are many mountain lions and bobcats. Um, salamanders, turkeys, pheasants, everything is in the National Forest if you can go. Similar, the Los Padres National Forest, uh, Black Bear, Bobcat, California Condor is a great trek there. Game birds like quail are there. And then the Biona Reserve, uh, which is down close to Long, no, not Long Beach area, where is it? Palisades, I think, area. Um, is great if you're interested in learning bird tracks. Every type of bird that is on migration stops there. And you could learn the names of birds if you're interested in birding, but you could also watch for their tracks and ID them as the bird is walking. It's a great resource. So we are going to do a quick activity. Oh, we're really early. Great. Uh, using the chat, Celeste is going to help. Um, can anybody describe the difference between feline and canine tracks? All right, so we have one response here. Um, feline tracks usually don't have the claws um, or the nails, whereas the canine ones do. Great. Um, also, the feline tracks have three lobes at the bottom. Nice. <laughs> um, the canine, center pad has the little swoop instead of the three lobes. And on the canine tracks, you can draw an X through the track. Uh, I think that's all the differences, right? We got it. That's perfect, yeah. The only <laughs> thing I would add is the nails. Nails, yes. Nails. The, the very first one, a couple okay. of them mentioned. Um, that the canines have the nails and the felines don't. Perfect. Um, can anyone name an example of a wildlife sign? This is really early to talk. Tracks. <laughs> That's true. Um, scat. Yes. Ooh, this is a good one. Fur or broken branches. Nice. <clears throat> um, tufts of fur or feathers um, in the grass. Fur um, or flattened grass. I love it. And all really good. Can anyone identify? the track shown. We've got one guess for mountain lion. We've got a guess for feline, mountain lion or bobcat. Nice, you guys are so with it. <laughs> uh, 
So Celeste wanted me to share about becoming a certified trekker, if it is something that everyone is interested. Um, the Becoming a certified tracker is great. It's great on your resume. It just improves your the work you do in the outdoors, whether you're volunteering or teaching or leading a group. It's a huge tool and becoming certified in it sort of not only helps you include it on your experience and your resume, but also shows that you've reached that point that you are in the position that you could train on this. A certified tracker experience looks just like this. This was my test. Um, people will go out, the trainers will go out and they will mark tracks within a half mile radius and they will number them and flag them. And you will be assigned one at a time to go out in the area and identify what the things are that are being shown. And it's anything from, uh, a duck track up to a track that you haven't seen, but you've only read about in books that happens to be in that area. And that's where the geography of tracking comes into comes into aid a lot. When you're out, you don't want to see a hooved animal track and go, oh, maybe it's a moose, because you, through your research, know that there are not moose in that area. So by process of elimination, you would say, is it a big horn sheep? Is it a mule deer? Is it a, and that's a huge aid in as you become trackers. Those little tricks that we talked about, about recognizing the nails, the signs about X marks the spot or the star, great tools. Um, maybe this animal has a tail. Do I see a tail drag? Yes or no? Maybe it's a reptile. Maybe it's an opossum. Do I, what are my signs that I look for? All of that is great help and a gain of knowledge before you go into testing. To become a certified tracker, you usually register with a testing location. They are everywhere. Most people become certified based on the regions that they are in. I am a California certified tracker with a specialist in Southern California, vertebrae specific, specifically, but I have uh, mentors that are certified in every region of North America, Africa, and are working on Alaska right now. So people can be certified in anything and that's becoming a tracker never ends in that respect. If you like learning and like wildlife, it's even a great hobby to take or a great professional to, uh, direction to take. So uh, I want to share some resources, sort of, if you want to know more, this is, I call it my Bible. It's a field guide to animal tracks and scat. I'll share the resources with you. It it's specifically for California, which I appreciate, but it breaks down by animal with great clear pictures and tells you why the track looks the way it does. If you decide you wanna go out tracking, I have a little tool here. Everybody sort of relies on you providing measurement of what the track looked like. If you submit it and say, I don't know what this is, but I know it's a bird that sits on branches, they may say, how long is it? How wide is it? So most of us carry a little tape measure with us. Most of us use something. If we don't have a tape measure, people carry a penny, like you saw in the picture earlier. You might carry a quarter or a car key, just something that's a universal size in all of your photographs. Um, if you get somewhere and there's a whole row of photographs, sorry, of tracks, and you don't know what any of them are, then we say go and take a picture of each one, take a picture of the wide swath of photographs, because you might be seeing movement of an animal chasing another animal. And all of that's covered in this great book. Another one that a lot of people, including my mentor, use is the Tracker's Handbook. It's a 
used by hunters and naturalists and outdoors enthusiasts. And it talks a lot more about the physical characteristics of the track, that when you approach it, the snow surrounding the track tells you how recently it was put there, things like that. And then I use this one a lot uh, when I'm working with kids. It's mammal tracks and signs. And it's got wonderful photographs that are bright and were taken under a um, in a studio setting. So even if you're looking at scat, it's perfectly lit with great outlines of what's included in it. I'll share all those with the PowerPoint if anyone is interested. There. Does anyone? Kelly, um, we have a yeah. question that came through the chat. Do you know of any groups um, specifically around the San Gabriel Valley um, or in LA area in general um, to learn to go tracking with? I don't know because I don't live in that area anymore, but I will find out and we'll send it out to the group. There is a great uh, resource on, it might be on Facebook for wildlife trackers, I think is what it's called. And it is a group of people who know tracking up and down, back and forth. And beginners will submit a photo there and people will help them identify what the track is of. There's also a resource that's an app that sort of takes the place of carrying these books around with you. I believe it's called iTrack. And it's very similar to what I've created for you here. It's an image of a foot or an image of a track that you can carry with you on your phone. And if you get somewhere and go, well, I'm not sure what that is, you'll be able to look it up on your app and it'll say, you'll compare the image to what you, you're seeing. It's not a great app, but it's a good app if you don't want to carry books with you. Awesome, those sound like great resources. Um, we have a question that came in the chat. Have you ever found a feline scrape? Yeah, wow, somebody knows it. So a lot of felines, even domestic cats will scrape to show a, I didn't bring a picture of it, to show that they're there, it's their terrain, it's their area, it's their area maybe to signal to a female that's in the area. And it looks very similar to if you imagined a cat's foot with nails out scraping on dirt. But it's specific in the location and the length and the size of the foot that made the scrape. I have a photo that I can send with the group if people are interested. So you, you have seen one in the wild, Kelly? Uh, I've seen them at Franklin Canyon. Do you know what kind of feeling it was? It was a mountain lion scrape. And when I saw it, I walked over it and then I went, oh, wait a second. And then this feeling came over me of like, how close is this mountain lion? How long ago was this done? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, do we have, let's see, here's another question that just came in. Have you ever tracked any tracks to the source? Um, what animals are easier to find like this? That's a great question. So typically birds, lizards, reptiles are the less spooked by people. The closest I've gotten to tracking a large mammal to the source is a black bear. We were able to track it over a couple of days with its scat and with its signs and regurgitated food. And we were able to say, okay, it's bedding in this area because we don't see any tracks leaving this area, but we weren't able to find exactly where it was, which is probably for the best for its safety and ours. Um, well, I found that I have a couple of cameras set up out in the Santa Monica Mountains, and I've seen a couple of owls come down every single night to this water source my camera's near, and then been able to time it when I was there in the evening to know when the owl is going to be there. But I haven't tracked an owl. 
physically to a spot. It's usually day after, probably because most animals feel safest when there aren't people around, so they're most active. Um, going back to the bear, did you, when you, you said you were tracking the bear for a couple of days, did you have to camp out? To we camped at Malibu State Park, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. Yeah. There are, um, if you want like that rush of finding a black bear print, the Angeles Forest is great, but also um, there's an MRCA park in Santa Clarita, Towsley, maybe, that's, I have found great tracks there near the restrooms, nor, near the old home, whatever it's called, every time I've been there. And that's because there's a stream that runs close by. So the animals come to the water and they're usually walking around. So if you want that big aha, I have definitely found a track. That's a great place to go. Great. And well, just a reminder, we will be sending out a list of um, parks around the LA area that are good places to find tracks. All right, any other questions? Um, go ahead and feel free to pop those in. Let's see, here's one. Um, oh, is there, are there any, besides the way that the print or the track is pointed, are there any other ways to tell which direction the animal's going? Yeah, so sort of. As you become more experienced as trackers, you'll learn about gait, which is their footfall, which way their footfall is going. Uh, you'll learn how to tell the difference between a stop track and an in movement track, but that gets really technical for an intro class. Um, generally, if the animal, if the track is flat, the animal had stopped. If the track is sort of pushed into the element, the sand, the snow, the dust, then it was in movement. So there's lots um, more to dig into beyond yes. this little intro session. Um, great, any last questions? Let's see, oh, there's one. Uh, coming in the Q&A box. Um, Kelly, do you have any resources or resource groups for the high desert? Do you know of any? I know that, I don't know if this is high desert, forgive me, that um, Aurora Boriega, that place where the wildflowers are, there's a trekking group there. Oh, Anza, Anza Borrega? Yes, that's it, sorry. There's a trekking group that works out of there too. And there's, I believe, a class that's offered there also. Is that high desert or low desert? I think it might be low, but I don't know actually. Um, that sounds like a cool resource. Yeah, if we come across any other groups, um, we'll definitely add those into the email. Um, and then, Here's a great question, Kelly. Are, will there be any more tracking webinars? I think it depends on interest. There, I usually introduce it in four stages. This is the first stage. And the next stage is half in person, half in class. So it depends on the level of interest. For the volunteers that I work with, this is usually where they want to stop because it's a lot of information all at once for them. I could also just do reptiles, just do birds, or we could do scat. There's a lot in under this umbrella to do based on interest. Great. Yeah, well, I think we would gauge interest, but um, once we are able to return to in-person programming, there's potential to do um, like a little more in-depth tracking course um, for sure. like on location at Franklin Canyon or something. So. 
Well, excellent. Well, I want to thank um, everybody, all the participants for coming today. Um, we really appreciate you coming and attending um, uh, this webinar as part of the Training Institute. And a huge thanks to Kelly. Um, thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and um, expertise on this subject. Uh, I think it's very cool to have this intro webinar and kind of give people a taste for tracking and um, we'll definitely be following up with more um, resources for you all to learn more um, and dig a little deeper into wildlife tracking. Um, I want to also let people know that in that follow-up email, um, look out for the resources and also a survey um, where you can share your feedback on this webinar. Um, and we'll be including that list of parks um, where you can go out and practice what you've learned. Um, and then finally, uh, as part of the Training Institute, I just want to plug one of our upcoming trainings. We have um, an Interpreting Tongva History um, and Culture uh, webinar coming up that's led by Josh and Duho, um, and that's going to be on June 9th. So if um, interpreting Tongva culture is of interest um, to you in your professional or personal worlds, uh, please join us. And like I said, that'll be June 9th, and you can sign up for that online, communitynatureconnection.org slash trainings. Um, and otherwise, that wraps us up. Um, thanks, everybody, so much for being here, and thanks again to Kelly. Um, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.